Okay, more Carson and more arrows and mm, some of my favorite chapters of the whole book. I've been really looking forward to this part. It's just so good. Um, anyway, I'm gonna just start and I'm gonna try really hard not to like continually interrupt this time. Um, okay, chapter 11. I think I'm probably just gonna do 11 and 12, which are called, um, What Does the Lover Want From Love? And Symbolon. I think that will get us through plenty for the day. Anyway, okay, here we go. My astonishing victory over Menti did not give me a pleasure one hundredth part as intense as the pain she gave me when she left me for Monsieur de Rosbier from Stendhal, Life of Henri Bouard. Here goes. On the surface of it, the lover wants the beloved. This, of course, is not really the case. If we look carefully at a lover in the midst of desire, for example, Sappho in her fragment 31, we will see how severe and experienced for her is confrontation with the beloved, even at a distance. Union would be annihilating. What the lover in this poem needs is to be able to face the beloved and yet not be destroyed. That is, she needs to attain the condition of the man who listens closely. His ideal impassivity constitutes for her a glimpse of a new possible self. Could she realize that self? Could she realize that self? She too would be equal to God amidst desire. To the degree that she fails to realize it, she may be destroyed by desire. Both possibilities are projected onto a screen of what is actual and presence by means of the poet's tactic of triangulation. That godlike self, never known before, now comes into focus and vanishes again in one quick shift of view. As the planes of vision jump, the actual self and the ideal self and the difference between them connect in one triangle momentarily. The connection is Eros. To feel its current pass through her is what the lover wants. So what she's saying right now is that the lover says that the, the lover says the, that they want the beloved. Like, oh, I, I love this person. I want this person. But what they really want, we can't have that person. How that person is like a, an act of annihilation because it annihilates the desire itself. Um, and what you have instead, according to Carson, at least this is what she's proposing, is that what the lover wants is to feel eros, to feel the lack and the separation between the self that the lover knows internally and the self that the lover perceives by way of hmm, not by way of the self the potential self that the lover perceives that is in contrast to the self that the lover knows internally that's as far as she's gotten so far i almost put the cart before the horse which is not okay so um the godlike self, that godlike self, never known before, now comes into focus and vanishes again in one quick shift of view. As the planes of vision jump, the actual self and the ideal self and the difference between them connect in one triangle momentarily. That connection is Eros. To feel its current pass through her is what the lover wants. The essential features that define this Eros have already emerged in the course of our exploration of bitter sweetness. Simultaneous pleasure and pain are its symptom. Lack is its animating, animating fundamental constituent. As syntax, it impressed us as something of a subterfuge. Properly a noun, eros acts everywhere like a verb. I've heard that recently. Its action is to reach and the reach of desire involves every lover in an activity of the imagination. 
it is no new idea that the imagination has a powerful role to play in human desire. Homer's description of Ellen Helen in the Iliad is perhaps the archetypal demonstration of it. The description is withheld. Homer merely tells us that the old men on the wall of Troy watched her pass and let out a whisper. It is no discredit for Trojans and well-grieved Achaeans to suffer long anguish for a woman like that. Helen remains universally desired, universally imaginable in the poem. Perfect. Because Homer withheld the actual description. Um, we just know, it's really smart actually, we're just told, Homer just, just relates the effect of, of Helen's presence. Erotic theorists suspend, not suspend, erotic theorists spend a considerable time discovering and rediscovering the lover's imagination from different angles. Aristotle defines the dynamic and imaginative delight of desire in his rhetoric. Desire is a reaching out, or rexes, for the sweet, he says. And the man who is reaching for some delight, whether in the future as hope or in the past as memory, does so by means of an act of imagination. Andreas Capellanus analyzes the pain of amorous longing in the same light in his 12th century treatise De Amore, insisting that this passio is a thoroughly mental event. The suffering of love does not arise out of any action, but only from the cogitation of the mind upon what it sees does that suffering issue. That feels weird. The suffering of love does not arise out of any action, but only from the cogitation of the mind upon what it sees does that suffering issue. Stendhal, in his celebrated essay on love, uncovers in the lover a fantasizing process that he names crystallization after a phenomenon witnessed in the minds of Salzburg. Leave a lover with his thoughts for 24 hours and this is what will happen. At the salt mines of Salzburg, they throw a leafless wintry bough into one of the abandoned workings. Two or three months later, they pull it out covered with a, shine, with a shining deposit of crystals. The smallest twig, no bigger than a tomtit's claw, is studded with a galaxy of scintillating diamonds. The original branch is no longer recognizable. What I have called crystallization is a mental process which draws from everything that happens new proofs of the perfection of the loved one. Crystallization. Hold, oh, please. All right. Crystallization, right. Kierkegaard also devotes some thought to this sensuously idealizing power that beautifies and develops the one desired so that he flushes an enhanced beauty by its reflection. The force by which, um, hmm, I guess Don Juan seduces may be found in this energy of sensuous desire, Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard concludes, with a trace of relief. Freudian theory too takes note of this projective faculty of the human erotic instinct, ascribing to it the scheduled mischief known as transference in psychoanalytic situations. Transference arises in almost every psychoanalytic relationship when the patient insists on falling in love with the doctor, despite the latter's determined aloofness, warnings, and discouragements. An important lesson in erotic mistrust is available to the an analysand who observes himself concocting in this way a love object out of thin air. Such concoctions fascinate the modern novelist. And Anna, Anna Karenina's passion for Vronsky depends on a mental act. She puts her hands on his shoulders and she put her hands on his shoulders and looked at him for a long time with a profound, passionate, and at the same time searching look. She was studying his face to make up for the time she hadn't seen him. She was doing what she always did when she saw him, comparing the image of him in her imagination, incomparably superior and impossible in reality. With him as he was. Adam Bovary's, Adam? Emma Bovary's love letters to Rodolphe enact the same process. But as she wrote, she saw in her mind's eye another man, a phantom composed of her most passionate memories, her most enjoyable books, and her strongest desires. 
At last he became so real and so tangible that she was thrilled and amazed. Yet he was so hidden under the abundance of his virtues that she was unable to imagine him clearly. The heroine of Italico Calvino's novel, The Non-Existent Knight, is a splendid voluptuary who finds she can only feel genuine desire for the knight of the title, an empty suit of armor. All others are either known or knowable and cannot arouse her. Here we arrive at the nub of the matter, not for the first time. That which is known, attained, possessed, cannot be an object of desire. In love, possession is nothing, only delight matters, says Stendhal. Eros is lack, says Socrates. This dilemma is given a still more subtle image by Yasunari Kawabata. His novel Beauty and Sadness recounts the early days of the marriage of Oki and Fumiko. Oki is a novelist and Fumiko a typist in a news agency. She types all his manuscripts. And this connection is the substance of Oki's newlywed fascination with his bride. It was something of a lover's game, the sweet togetherness of newlyweds. But there was more to it than that. When his work first appeared in a magazine, he was astonished at the difference in effect between a pen written manuscript and the tiny characters in print. As Oki becomes habituated to this gap between manuscript and published work, his passion for Fumiko fades and he takes a mistress. It is in the difference between cursive and typeface, between the real Vronsky and the imaginary one, between Sappho and the man who listens closely, between an actual knight and an empty suit of armor, that desire is felt. Across this space, a spark of Eros moves in the lover's mind to activate delight. Delight is a movement. Delight is a movement, kinesis, of the soul in Aristotle's definition. No difference, no movement, no eros. A mood of knowledge is emitted by the spark that leaps in the lover's soul. He feels on the verge of grasping something not grasped before. In the Greek poets, it is a knowledge of self that begins to come into focus self not known before and now disclosed by the lack of it, by pain, by a whole, bitterly. In the Greek poets, it is a knowledge of self that begins to come into focus, a self not known before and now disclosed by the lack of it, a notion of the self that is in contrast, sharp contrast to the notion of the self that you know. That's what she's saying the ancient Greek poets would say that oh that what the lover feels um, like spark leap or whatever you whatever they try to like um, what, whatever language they use to try to describe what the feeling of eros what that is is this notion of the self as you know yourself and then this like new impossible, but not really possible, impossibly different potential, but not potential version of the self that exists through um, perceiving the self from the perspective of the beloved. She'll say it in better words in just a minute, but like that notion of, a, of, of an imagination of the self and then a recognition or a realization, like recognition, a recognition of what seems to be a possible other self, better self. This isn't really possible. That's like that feeling that gets described as a leap or a spark or a like shift of the soul, movement. That, that is the center of Eros. That's what she's saying, ancient Greek poets would say. Not all lovers respond to erotic knowledge so negatively. We are struck by the equanimity with which Virginia Woolf's character, Neville, records, something now leaves me, 
And we saw what a gust of elation accompanies the change of self for Nietzsche. But then Nietzsche calls the modern world an ass that says yes to everything. The Greek poets do not say yes. They allow that erotic experience is sweet to begin with, gluku. They acknowledge ideal possibilities, opened out for selfhood by erotic experience. They do so in general by divining it in the person of the god Eros. Sappho, as we have seen, projects the ideal in a particular person, in the particular person of the man who listens closely in fragment 31. The speaker in that fragment reflecting on the situation and like longing to be the man who listens closely, not because that man is close and because that man is in conversation with the beloved, but because that man is in conversation with the love, beloved without being annihilated. That man is, to be continued. A more narcissistic lover, namely Alcibiades and Plato's symposium, subsumes the ideal to himself, blandly announcing his motive for pursuing Socrates. For me, nothing has a higher priority than to perfect myself but a sense of exultation at the thought of incorporating the self's possibilities within the self's identity is missing. In these ancient representations, bittersweet Eros prints consistently as a negative image. Presumably a positive picture could be made if the lover were ever to reincorporate his lack, the version of the self that is ideal and possible, maybe potential, um, or imagined as potential, um, a positive image, a positive picture could be made if the lover were able, ever to reincorporate his lack into a new and better self. Or could it? Is that positive picture what the lover wants from love? An ancient answer presents itself. Aristophanes puts this very question to a pair of imaginary lovers in Plato's Symposium. He pictures the lovers locked in an embrace and dismisses as absurd the notion that this mere amorous union is all they want. No, obviously, the soul of each is longing for something else, else which it cannot put into normal words, but keeps trying to express in oracles and riddles, and I think probably poetry. What is this something else? Aristophanes continues. Suppose that, as the lovers lay together, Hephaestus should come and stand over them, tools in hand, and ask, O oh, human beings, what is it that you want of one another? And suppose they were nonplussed, so he put the question again. Well, is this what you crave? To be joined in the closest possible union with one another, so as not to leave one another by night or day? If that is your craving, I am ready to melt you together and fuse you into a single unit, so that you two, both, that you two become one, and as long as you live, you may both, as one, live a common life. And when you die, you may also, down here in Hades, one instead of two, die a common death. Consider whether this is what you desire, whether it would satisfy you to obtain this. Eternal oneness is Hephaestus's offer. The lover's response is not heard. Instead, Aristophanes himself intervenes to pronounce, no lover could want anything else. Now, how credible a witness is Aristophanes or his first spokesman Hephaestus in the question of what a lover really wants? Two reservations strike us. Hephaestus, omnipotent cuckold of the Olympian pantheon, can be viewed as at best a qualified authority on matters erotic. And Aristophanes' judgment, no lover could want anything else, is belied by the anthropology of his own myth. Was it the case that the round beings of his fantasy remained perfectly content rolling about the world in prelapsarian oneness? No. They got big ideas and started rolling toward Olympus to make an attempt on the gods. They began reaching for something else. So much for oneness. It is not the number one as we have seen in example after example to which the lover's mind inclines when he is given a chance to express his desire. Maneuvers of triangulation disclose him. For his delight is in reaching. To reach for something perfect would be perfect delight. To reach for something perfect would be perfect delight. Not to grasp at something perfect, but to reach for something, but to reach for the something perfect. 
the sweet apple still dangling in Sappho's fragment 105 represents this wrenching, delightful fact. We have looked at some of the, the tactics of incompleteness by which Sappho sustains desire and desirability in the poem. We have looked at similar tactics penetrating lover's logic and contracting upon a solitude unknown before. They are tactics of imagination, which sometimes turn upon enhancing the beloved, sometimes upon reconceiving the lover, but which are all aimed at defining one certain edge or difference. An edge between two images that cannot merge in a single focus because they do not derive from the same level of reality. One is actual, one is possible. To know both, keeping the difference visible is the subterfuge called Eros. Symbol on. Space reaches out from us and translates the world. From a Wilka piece called What Birds Plunge Through is Not the Intimate Space. Symbol on. We began our investigation of bittersweet eros by countenancing a mistranslation of Sappho's Wuku Pikron. We assumed that Sappho puts Wuku first because Eros's sweetness is obvious to everyone, his bitterness less so. We then turned our attention to the bitter side. These judgments were shallow as we are now in a position to see. So she circled, made full circle and is coming back around to think about bitterness again with a new, like newly constructed, together newly constructed framework or reflecting upon our initial reflections of bitterness to show us that we like can do more with them now. And she's awesome. Anyway, um, these judgments, our earlier judgments were shallow as we are now in a position to see. Eros's sweetness is inseparable from his bitterness. And each participates in a way that not, in a way not yet obvious at all in our human will to knowledge. There would seem to be some resemblance between the way Eros acts in the mind of a lover and the way knowing acts in the mind of a thinker. It has been an endeavor of philosophy from the time of Socrates to understand the nature and uses of that resemblance. But not only philosophers are intrigued to do so. I would like to grasp why it is that these two activities, falling in love and coming to know, make me feel genuinely alive. That use of I right there is just really striking to me. She doesn't do it all the time. She says we a ton. It feels different to say we than it does to say I. Anyway, I would like to grasp, I really would, why it is that these two activities, falling in love and coming to know, make me feel genuinely alive. There is something like an electrification in them. They are not like anything else but they are like each other. How? Let us consider whether the ancient poet's conception of glupu picrotes, as we have come to understand it, has any, has any light to shed on this matter. All men by their very nature reach out to know, says Aristotle. If this is so, it discloses something important about the activities of knowing and desiring. They have at their core the same delight, that of reaching, and until this entail the same pain, that of falling short or being deficient. This discourse may be already implied in a certain usage of Homer, for epic diction has the same verb, now, now my, for to be mindful, to have in mind, to direct one's attention to, and to woo, for it be a suitor stationed at the edge of itself or of its present knowledge, the thinking mind launches a suit for understanding into the unknown. So too, the wooer stands at the edge of his value as a person and asserts a claim across the boundaries of another. Both mind and wooer reach out from what is known and actual to something different, possibly better, desired, something else. Think about what that feels like. 
when we try to think about our own thinking, as when we try to feel our own desire, we find ourselves located at a blind point. It is like the point where the observer of Velazquez's painting, Las Meninas, stands as he views the painting. This is a painting of Velazquez painting the king and queen of Spain. But the king and queen are not part of the picture. Where are they? There are many people, including Vasquez, in the painting, but none seem to be the king and queen, and all are gazing steadily out at someone else beyond the picture frame. Who? As we meet the looks of these people, we imagine at first that they are gazing at us. Then we notice some faces in a mirror at the back of the room. Who are those faces? Our own? No. Those, these are the king and queen of Spain. But now, just where are the king and the queen located? They seem to be standing precisely where we are standing as we gaze into the painting at their reflection there. Then where are we? No, that's not how to say that. Then where are we, for that matter? Who are we? We are no one in particular. And we are standing at a blind point. Michel Foucault has analyzed Velazquez's painting and its blind point in his study of the archaeology of human knowledge, the order of things. Foucault calls the blind point that essential hiding place into which our gaze disappears from ourself at the moment of actual looking. For the first time ever, I'm having and feeling and thinking echoes of like quantum physics and particles waves and the impact of observation. We cannot see that point as we cannot think thought or desire desire except by a subterfuge. In Las Meninas we see the subterfuge just coming into focus in a mirror at the back of the room. In Foucault's terms this mirror provides a metathesis of visibility because around it in the because around it, the painting organizes a deliberate vacancy. The lines that run through the depth of the picture are not complete. They all lack a segment of their trajectories. This gap is caused by the absence of the king, an absence that is an artifice on the part of the painter. Velazquez's, Velazquez's artifice triangulates our perception so that we all but see ourselves looking. That is, he has arranged his painting in such a way that a haunting fact gradually dawns on us as we observe it. Namely, the fact that the vacancy recorded by the mirror is not that of King Philip IV and Queen, Mer can't speak. Queen Mariana. It is our own. Standing like understudies in the place where the king and queen would be, we recognize, vaguely disappointed, that the faces looming from the mirror are not our own. And we all but see if the angle did not keep jumping out of focus. It's that point where we disappear into ourselves in order to look. A point lying in the gap between ourselves and then. Attempts to focus on that point pull the mind into vertigo. While at the same time, a particular acute delight is present. We long to see that point, although it tears us. Why? There is no stillness at that point. Its components split and diverge each time we try to bring them into focus, as if interior continents are, were wrenching askew in the mind. It is not a point upon which we can gaze in such a way as to peacefully converge with the king and queen in one image there, one noun. That point is a verb. Each time we look at it, it acts. How? Let us keep these questions in mind as we consider another point on the landscape of human thinking, a point which is also a verb. Moreover, a verb that triangulates, haunts, splits, wrenches, and delights us each time it acts. Let us consider the point of verbal action called metaphor. To give names to nameless things by transference, metaphora, from things kindred or similar in appearance, is how Aristotle describes the function of metaphor. In current theory, this process of thought may best be regarded as an interaction between the subject and the predicate 
of the metaphorical sentence. Metaphorical sense is produced by the whole sentence and works through what one critic calls a semantic impertinence. That is, a violation of the code of pertinence or relevance that rules the ascription of predicates in ordinary use of the language. The violation allows a new pertinence or congruence to emerge, which is the metaphorical meaning, from the collapse of the ordinary or literal meaning. How does new pertinence emerge? There is in the mind a change or shift of dis distance, which Aristotle calls an epiphora, bringing two heterogeneous things close to reveal their kinship. The innovation of metaphor occurs in the shift of distance from far to near and it is affected by imagination. A virtuoso active imagination brings the two things together, sees their incongruence, then sees also a new congruence. Meanwhile, continuing to recognize the previous incongruence through the new congruence. Both the ordinary literal sense and a novel sense are present at once in the words of a metaphor. Both the ordinary descriptive reference and a novel reference are held in tension by the metaphor's way of looking at the world. Thus, tension of an acute and unresolvable kind informs this mental action. It demands of the mind, mind a stereoscopic vision or a split reference, that is, an ability to hold in equipoise two perspectives at once. Paul Ricoeur calls this mental tension a state of war wherein the mind has not yet reached conceptual peace, but is caught between distance and proximity, between sameness and difference. Such warfare marks the landscape of all human thought, according to Ricoeur. We may speak with Gadamer of the fundamental metaphoricity of thought to the extent that the figure of speech that we call metaphor allows us a glance at the general procedure by which we produce concepts. This is because in the metaphoric process, the movement towards mm, the movement toward genus is arrested by the resistance of the difference and, as it were, intercepted by the figure of rhetoric. An act of arrest and interception that splits the mind and puts it in a state of war within itself is the act called metaphor. Let us compare with this act our experience of Las Meninas. At the core of the given name of that object at which all the eyes looking out of the painting are looking. For a moment we imagine they are all looking at us. Then we see the faces in the mirror. Our movement toward naming those faces is arrested by the difference between the two species, ourselves, the king and queen, who are candidates for that genus. The arrest occurs when, with a wrench that splits our vision, divides our judgment, and is not resolved no matter how often we, re we return to it for. Each time we look, our moment of delighted self-recognition is intercepted by two dimly royal faces in the glass. Aristotle pinpoints such a moment of interception in metaphorical thinking when the mind seems to say to itself, well, how true, I was quite wrong after all. He calls it a paradoxical element and judges it one of the essential pleasures of metaphor. Eros also has something paradoxical at the core of his power at that point where bitter intercepts sweet. There is a shift of distance that brings up close what is absent and different. Absences of eyes in the statues present mm -mm, present Helen to Menelaus as he stands in his empty hall at the blind point between love and hate. They love him and they hate him and they long to possess him, says Aristophanes of the love affair between the Greek demos and its favorite Alcibiades. I am in love, I am not in love. I am insane, I'm not insane, cries out Anacreon. Something paradoxical arrests the lover. Arrest occurs at a point of inconsinity Arrest occurs at a point of inconsinity between the actual and the possible, a blind point where the reality of what we are 
disappears into the possibility of what we could be if we were other than we are, but we are not. We are not the king and queen of Spain. We are not lovers who can both feel and attain their desires. We are not poets who need no metaphor or symbol to carry our meaning across. The English word symbol is the Greek word symbolon, which means in the ancient world, one half of a knuckle bone carried as a token of identity to someone who has the other half. Think like those friendship bracelets, I mean, friendship necklaces that you used to have like heart BFF or BFFE and two, one half would say one thing and the other half would complete it. You give it to a friend and you know you both have the pieces. Together, the two halves compose one meaning. A metaphor is a species of symbol. So is a lover. In the words of Aristophanes in Plato's Symposium, each one of us is but the symbolon of a human being. Sliced in half like a flatfish, two instead of one, and each pursues a never-ending search for the symbolon of himself. So if we, I'm gonna read this again, and I'm going to um, exchange symbol or symbol on because that's what she wants us to be thinking while we're reading both at once it's one of her favorite things and i'm about to see it saying okay each one of us is but the symbol each one of us is but the symbol of a human being and each pursues a never-ending search for the symbol of himself Every hunting, hungering lover is half of a knuckle bone, wooer of a meaning that is inseparable from its absence. The moment when we, when we understand these things, when we see what we are projected on a screen of what we could be, is invariably a moment of wrench and arrest. We love that moment and we hate it. We have to keep going back to it, after all, if we wish to maintain contact with the possible. But this also entails watching it disappear. Only a God's word has no beginning or end. Only a God's desire can reach without lack. Only the paradoxical God of desire, exception to all these rules, is never-endingly filled with lack itself. Sappho drew this conception together and called Eros Leucopicron. So says Maximus of Tyre, a sophist and itinerant lecturer of the second century AD. Wow. It's only like six pages. I'm going to read one more. A novel sense. The last chapter was a lot. And that last paragraph, last few paragraphs of that last chapter was a whole lot. This moment where she's bringing together, talking about holding at the same time and like being able to consider at the same time like two separate, parallel, equally powerful and plausible understandings of an idea. So like in metaphor, two things that seem to be completely disconnected, um, completely unrelated, but but because the poet is capable of like looking and noticing and observing things differently than we are, the poet sees both of these things and sees their incongruence, sees their separateness, their difference and then looks at them again and says, but wait, no, there's something uniquely, there is some sliver of unique congruence, connection or reflection or recognition between these two things that we think of as completely separate and, 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 and disparate from one another. And the poet notes that sameness and like, literally says it, and then in using metaphor, X is Y or if we want to think a little bit broad, more broadly about some like symbolism and literary figures of speech, we could think about like analogy. So X is like Y, but so much more powerful to say X is Y. As readers, we know that X is not Y. We know that, um, I don't know, I'm not gonna come up with a good metaphor. So pick your favorite metaphor. Um, we know that X is not Y, but by reading it, we have the opportunity to think about, well, but wait, maybe like, what, a, what about X is like Y or, or how does Y 
tell us something more, reveal to us something more, help us like have the right perspective to recognize some connection between why and vice versa. How does um, why tell us something about X? How does why thinking about why allow us to see X differently and somehow more clearly, more fully itself by thinking about this minute connection to this other very separate seeming thing. So when she's talking about those things, she's talking about like, in order to understand metaphor, you have to understand like, and think about both of those things at once. And that's what we're doing, even though we don't realize that we're doing it. That's like kind of the magic of poems, one of the many kinds of magic of poems. But so that's happening. And then she also, while she's talking about that, how we understand this like linguistic figure, she's also talking about how in, in, in striving to understand those two things that seem to be not connected, but when we pause and look, we notice are very connected, um, but also always like perpetually separate. She's also holding that up as a metaphor. Her analysis of metaphor enables us to understand metaphorically the relationship between the understanding of the self like within the self and then the possible understanding of the self as understood through the beloved. And she's saying we don't want those things to meet because the delight of metaphor comes from the recognition of what we believe to be incongruence or forever separation. So if the ideal self and the real self that, that we feel and see as separate and always separate and, and like, we delight in metaphor by making the connection between the two, by seeing the difference and also seeing the connection between the ideas. We do the same thing with versions of the self in eros and desire or love or whatever you want to call it and if we put those two together we no longer have the connection they just are one thing so she's kind of extending our notion of like the godlike man who sits and listens close and sappho's fragment jealousy fragment um by saying like not only is he godlike because he can look and stay separate and look and um, listen without being annihilated or drawn too close, um, without seeming to feel what the speaker feels. But he's also godlike because he is not reacting to the way the speaker is, the separation between himself and himself that he understands internally and then the, his version of the self that he could triangulate through the beloved or he doesn't actually love her that's the alternative anyway a novel sense nature has no outline but imagination has from william blake's notebooks imagination is the core of desire it acts at the core of metaphor it is essential to the activity of reading and writing. In the archaic lyric poetry of Greece, these three trajectories intersected, perhaps fortuitously, and imagination transcribed on human desire, an outline more beautiful, some people think, than any before or since. We have seen what shape that outline took. Writing about desire, the archaic poets made triangles with their words. Or to put it less sharply, they represent situations that ought to involve two factors, lover and beloved, in terms of three, lover, beloved, and the space between. Actually, maybe kind of like this book is the space between. Lover, beloved, and the space between them, however realized. Is this outline just a fetish of the lyric imagination? <laughs> My students, would also ask that question of me because I end up leaning into triangulation all the time symbolically like as a way of visually understanding the relationships between complicated concepts anyway is this outline just a fetish of the lyric imagination no 
We have looked at tragedians and comic poets and epigrammists concerned with the bitter sweetness of desire. We have discovered the roots of the notion in Homer's Aphrodite. We have seen Plato turn the problem over. There is something essential to Eros here. The lyric poets caught its outline with sharp, mm, with sudden sharpness and left that in writing. What does the lover want from love is the question to which the lyric evidence led us. But now we should consider the matter from another side, where the nature of the lyric evidence cannot be separated from the fact of its transcription. And that fact remains mysterious. I mean by this that the lyric poets present a borderline case, living as they did in the first outburst of literary activity that followed the alphabet, commissioned as they were to compose lyrics for oral and public performance, but somehow involved also in making written record of these poems. They are poets exploring the edge between oral and literate procedure, probing forward to see what kind of thing writing is, reading is, and poetry can be. The position is not an easy one. Perhaps that is why the poems are so good. At any rate, the position gradually became easier as of readers. Let us superimpose on the question, what does the lover want from love? The questions, what does the reader want from reading? What is the writer's desire? Novels are the answer. I composed it in writing, says the Greek author, Cariton, at the beginning of his Kyraeus and Caleroe, earliest extant example of the genre that we call the novel or romance. The novel was from the beginning of written literature, which flourished in the Greco-Roman world from about the third century BC, when the spread of literacy and a vigorous book trade created a wide popular audience. Our terms novel and romance do not reflect an ancient name for the genre. Caritan refers to his work as erotica, pathemata, or erotic sufferings. These are love stories in which it is generically required that love be painful. The stories are told in prose and their apparent aim is to entertain readers. Four Greek novels from the ancient world are extant as well as some fragments and epitome, epi, epitomes? I don't know, dating from about the first century BC to the fourth century AD and a number of Latin romances. The plots are much the same, being love stories devoted to keeping the lovers apart and miserable until the last page. One editor has summed up the genre this way. A romantic story is the thread on which is hung a succession of sentimental and sensational episodes. The two main characters either fall in love with one another soon after the opening of the story, or in some cases are actually married and immediately separated. They are sundered time and again by the most improbable misfortunes. They face death in every form, Subsidiary couples are sometimes introduced, the course of whose true love runs very little smoother. Both the hero and heroine inspire a wicked and hopeless love in the breasts of others who become hostile influences, seeming at times likely to accomplish their final separation, but never with complete success. Occasionally, the narrative stops for the description of a place, a scene, or some natural object, only to be resumed at once with the painful adventures of the loving couple. And on the last page, all is cleared up, the complicated threads of the story fall apart with detailed and lengthy explanations, and the happy pair is united forever with the prospect of a long and prosperous life before them. Sounds like every typical romance, love story, etc., in the very cliched variety. And also like culturally so problematic, but that is a conversation for another time. Tactics of triangulation are the main business of the novel. These tactics are the ones familiar to us from the archaic poets, now employed prosaically and in extenso. So where the lyric was short and talked about love in, well, the impact of these generic changes is really important. And frankly, right now, I don't remember if she gets into this, but if she doesn't, I should, so. What she's saying is that novels, because of the genre of the novel, um, consider Eros in prose rather than poetry and do so in extended forms rather than in um, shorter poetic forms. The novelists play out as dilemmas of plot and character all those facets of erotic contradiction and difficulty that were first brought to light in lyric poetry. 
Rival lovers appear around every corner of the plot. Pretexts for pursuit and flight ramify from page to page. Obstacles to romantic union materialize in tireless variety. The lovers themselves devote considerable energy to obstructing their own desire. Should interfering parents, cruel pirates, bungling doctors, dogged grave robbers, dull slaves, mindless divinities, and the whims of chance not su suffice. Eidos is a favorite stratagem. Romantic heroes and heroines operate in a vague, exciting borderland between purity and sensuality. Whenever passion seems within reach, eidos falls like a veil between them. Remember that shame fastness. This eidos is the, ar no. this eidos is the ar archaic ethic of shame fastness, reinterpreted now in the narrow sense of chastity. Its mischievous machinery pervades romantic plots and exacts feats of virtue from lovers in return for protraction of the story. Aphrodisian chastity is the name given by one critic to this pleasing torment, for Aphrodite is the divinity in charge of the perversities of Eidos within the novel. She is chief designer and chief subverter of the story's changing triangles, both patron and enemy, inspiring lovers with a passion strong enough to resist all the temptations that she herself proceeds to hurl against it. Chaste lovers make her the object of their devotion and become the object of her abuse. Aphrodite's role in novels is an ambivalent, not to say paradoxical, one, like the role of Eros in archaic poetry. In his Ephesiaga, Xenophon of Ephesus, of Ephesus, sorry, gives us a summary image of Aphrodisian ambivalence. Describing the bridal chamber of his hero and heroine, Xenophon goes into details of the icon embroidered on the bed cover. Its subject is Aphrodite, the divinity responsible for bringing bride and groom together in the chamber but the scenario worked on the coverlet is not one that bodes well for the marriage. Aphrodite is pictured not as the dutiful wife of Hephaestus, but rather as mistress of Ares. Ares is decked out for an assignation with his beloved and Eros is leading him by the hand toward her, holding up a flaming torch. Xenophon's description of the icon would strike a note of recognition in any Greek reader. It evokes a scene pictured on numbers of ancient vases and no doubt familiar from daily life. The scene of the wedding procession, wherein a new bride was led by the hand to her husband's house, preceding by, preceded by flaming torches. The icon is a parody of standard wedding ritual in concept and in design. So much for marriage. Yet marriage remains the professed objective of every romantic hero and heroine. This puts them at odds with themselves and with Aphrodite. More important, the intention to consummate desires, desire puts the lovers at odds with the novelist, whose novel will end unless he can subvert their aim. There is something paradoxical in the relations between the novelist and his lovers. As a writer, he knows their story must end and wants it to end. So too, as readers, we know the novel must end and want it to end, but not yet, say the readers to the writer. But not yet, says the writer to his hero, hero and heroine. But not yet, says the beloved to the lover. And so the reach of desire continues. What is a paradox? A paradox is a kind of thinking that reaches out but never arrives at the end of its thought. Each time it reaches out, there is a shift of distance in mid-reasoning that prevents the answer from being grasped. Consider Zeno's well-known paradoxes. They are arguments against the reality of reaching an end. Zeno, Zeno's runner never gets to the finish line of the stadium. Zeno's Achilles never overtakes the tortoise. Zeno's arrow never hits the target. These are paradoxes about paradox. Each one contains a point where the reasoning seems to fold into itself and disappear. It can begin again, and so the reach continues. No, shoot. Each one contains a, contains a point where the reasoning seems to fold into itself and disappear or at least that is how it feels. Each time it disappears, it can begin again, and so the reach continues. If you happen to enjoy reasoning, you are delighted to begin again. On the other hand, your enjoyment of reasoning must entail some wish to arrive at a conclusion, so your delight has an edge of chagrin. In the bittersweetness of the exercise, we see the outline of Eros. You love Zeno and you hate him. You know there is a ruse operating in his paradoxes, yet you keep going back over them. 
and you keep going back to the paradoxes, not because you would like to see Achilles overtake the tortoise, but because you like trying to understand what kind of thing a paradox is. You like being situated at that blind but lively point where your reason is viewing itself or almost viewing itself. Why? We have come round to this blind point before when contemplating Velazquez's Las Meninas and considering the paradoxical action at the heart of metaphor. Novels give us another and broader access onto the blind point where they sustain the experience of paradox over many pages by means of many ruses. Let us see what we can read from the ruses of the novelists about the blind point and its desirability. Okay, that's all I'm gonna read today, I swear. Um, but I do wanna say that One, I feel very seen the last couple of paragraphs, minus the novel stuff. Um, and I think in part, I feel seen because that's how I actually feel. Like I like you go back to the thing that's, that's like the sticky thinking point because you enjoy the process of trying to get closer to understanding, not as a way to like destroy the thing, although in understanding it, you might destroy it, Right, that's the fear. Um, but in order to understand how the thing functions, because you appreciate the function itself, you appreciate the like process itself. And also I feel totally seen because of course she says you, which she doesn't usually do. She doesn't usually draw a distinction between her speaking self, her writing self, her voice in this text, and like us as readers. It's usually we. We are working together like, toward understanding, which of course is what she's talking. She goes around and goes around and goes around. She's just so good. Anyway, um, but she uses you there, which separates us from her. I don't know why she does that, except maybe just because of, she wants to hammer home, home this impact. Maybe she wants to like reach out to people who don't necessarily think of themselves as um, perpetually fascinated by the search for a better understanding of the functionality and structure of the thing, not to annihilate, but to more greatly appreciate. And she's trying, it's a rhetorical move that's trying to like bring more people into that position that I like automatically already feel and know that I am afflicted by or, um, or that I demonstrate. <sighs> anyway, Ann Carson, you're so good. Three chapters today, and I know this has been so long, I haven't even kept time, and that's probably gonna be bad, but it's just too good to stop. So I don't know, I can't say that I'll pick it back up tomorrow, but maybe I will. Um, and the next bit will start with something paradoxical, and it, it's only three pages, but I will not read more. Yeah. And then my page makes love, also very short. And then letters, letters, which is a little bit longer. So I'll probably read all of those next time. So good. Anyway, if you stuck around this far, you deserve something. You deserve the joy of understanding better how all of this functions. Hopefully that's what you're getting. Okay, I'm really stopping now. Next time.